Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here. Thanks for coming to your uh, daily briefing. Before I take your questions, I have uh, something to say about health care for seniors. You're catching on. Today, we are highlighting that thanks to the Affordable Care Act, millions of seniors and people with disabilities have access to more affordable prescription medications and free preventive services through Medicare. According to new data released by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services today, more than 25.4 million people covered by original Medicare received at least one preventive service at no cost to them during the first 11 months of 2013 because of the Affordable Care Act. The health care law is also closing the gap in prescription drug coverage known as the donut hole, where people with Medicare have had to pay the entire cost of prescription drugs out of pocket. As a result, since the health care law was enacted, more than 7 million seniors and people with disabilities have saved a total of nearly $9 billion on prescription drugs. That's an average savings of about $1,200 per person. If opponents of reform had their way and repealed the law, millions of seniors would not have access to free preventive services under Medicare and would once again have to shoulder the burden of higher out-of-pocket costs for their prescription drugs. Taken together, this is yet another way that the Republican repeal plan would raise costs for millions of Americans. I also wanted to mention that tomorrow, President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama will meet with a group of moms in the Oval Office to discuss how health care could help their families. Moms are a key part of our ongoing outreach and enrollment efforts and have an important role to play in helping their adult children, family members, and peers to sign up for coverage. And that's tomorrow. With that, I will take your question. I hope you noted the graphic also, part of a pattern here. Uh, Jim Keenan. Uh, thanks, Jake. A uh, couple questions on the NSA decision yesterday, uh, ruling. Uh, does, does the ruling in any way affect uh, the, re the reviews of NSA practices that, that are under uh, taking place at the President's direction? In other words, has he uh, asked for some of the concerns raised in this ruling to be considered as part of this review? Uh, well, first of all, the ruling just came down, as you know, yesterday, and for reaction uh, to a matter like that, I would refer you to the Department of Justice. I can tell you that DOJ has said, quote, we have seen the opinion and are studying it. We believe the program is constitutional, as previous judges have found, and we have no further comment at this time. So that's obviously part of a legal review that they are undertaking. With regard to the uh, review that the President asked for. The President's review group on intelligence and communications on Friday submitted their report to the President. The President is uh, grateful to the group, Richard Clark, Michael Morrell, Jeffrey Stone, Cass Sunstein, and Peter Swire, for devoting themselves to this effort over the past several months and providing thoughtful input for the administration to consider as we conclude the ongoing interagency review of signals intelligence collection being led by the White House. The review group's report draws on the group members' considerable expertise in intelligence, counterterrorism, civil liberties, law and privacy matters, and on their consultations with the U.S. government, privacy and civil liberties advocates in the private sector. As I mentioned yesterday, over the next several weeks, we will be reviewing the review group's report and its more than 40 recommendations as we consider the path forward, including sorting through which recommendations we will implement, which might require further study, and which we, uh, we will choose not to pursue. We expect uh, the overall internal review to be completed in January, uh, and the President will deliver remarks. And as I mentioned yesterday, the uh, review group's uh, report uh, we expect uh, to be released publicly. Did, um, I'm sorry, released what? Publicly. Uh, next month. Uh, I don't have timing on that, but we do expect it to re be released publicly. Did was the, were the re, were the, was the review or the ruling a subject of a discussion with the uh, tech leaders who were here today talking to the president? Uh, we will have a, a fuller readout for you. That meeting uh, was ongoing uh, as I came down here. Uh, the, uh, but as I mentioned yesterday, or we mentioned yesterday, the president and vice president uh, 
we're going to meet and are now currently meeting with executives from leading tech companies to discuss progress made in addressing performance and capacity issues with healthcare.gov and how government can better deliver IT to maximize uh, innovation, efficiency, and customer service. In the meeting, the President also announced that uh, Kurt Del Benny, who was most recently served as President of uh, the Microsoft Office Division, will succeed Jeff Zients as Senior Advisor to Secretary Sebelius and uh, leading the charge, uh, or our charge, with healthcare.gov and the health insurance marketplace. Uh, he starts tomorrow. Uh, the group discussed uh, the challenges around federal IT procurement. The meeting also uh, is addressing national security and economic impacts of the unauthorized intelligence disclosures. Uh, so that goes to the subject of your question. So it's certainly uh, under discussion. I am not aware that the court ruling was part of that. But again, I, I don't have a full readout for you as the meeting is ongoing. The, uh, the Government Accountability Project, which aims to protect whistleblowers, uh, argued today that this strengthens, this decision the ruling strengthens uh, Snowden's claims mm -hmm. for, for whistleblower status. Wondered if you, White House, has any reaction? Again, I, I have no comment on the ruling beyond what I uh, cited from DOJ. I certainly uh, would repeat what I said yesterday that, uh, you know, it is, remains our view that Mr. Snowden is accused of leaking classified information and that he faces felony charges here in the United States and he should be returned to the U.S. as soon as possible where he will be accorded full due process and protections. One last question on, on uh, Ukraine. Uh, Putin today extended an offer to provide uh, $15 billion in bond asset purchases as well as lower uh, energy costs to Ukraine. Uh, does the White House see that as interfering <coughs> in the decision making uh, in Kyiv or uh, what I can tell you is we've seen the reports of uh, that agreement and we're reviewing, uh, rather we're awaiting details and we'll review them when we see them, but uh, any agreements concluded between Kiev and Moscow uh, will not address the concerns of those who have gathered uh, in public protest across Ukraine. As we've said in the past, we urge the Ukrainian government to listen to its people and to find a way to restore a path uh, to the peaceful, just, democratic, and economically prosperous European future to which Ukrainian citizens aspire. And we urge the Ukrainian government to enter into immediate dialogue with the opposition and all other stakeholders who have expressed their desire for a better Ukraine through public demonstrations. Again, uh, we will look at uh, the details uh, as they become available of these uh, agreements that have been reported, but they don't. Uh, address the concerns that peaceful demonstrators have expressed uh, in, in Ukraine. Jeff. Jay, can you tell us how Kurt Delbeni was chosen for this job? Well, as you know, it's a position at uh, the Secretary, uh, the, at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, as Jeff Zients has done, uh, his successor, uh, Mr. Delbeni, will be serving as a senior advisor to Secretary Sebelius, and so the Secretary obviously makes the choice. The search for a successor uh, involved, in addition to the Secretary and members of her team, uh, certainly Mr. Zients and uh, the Chief of Staff here, Dennis McDonough. Uh, but I think uh, for any of you who know Mr. Del Benny's background, uh, you will know that he is uniquely suited to this task, uh, has vast experience uh, with uh, running a complex uh, piece of technology. And uh, the President and the Secretary are very uh, grateful that he's agreed to take on this position. So he'll be on the government payroll. Can you, can you tell us what he'll get paid? Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know the status of, of what he'll get paid or uh, how much. Uh, I think we said in the past that Mr. Zients uh, was essentially volunteering. Uh, but I've been mean, taking, I think, uh, a small uh, nominal uh, salary. I don't know the case with Mr. Uh, Del Benny, but we'll get that to you. Um, and can you give any more details about what Gene will do in his last month in January? Will he be involved in the budget still since he's staying a little longer? Mm -hmm. Did the union? Sure. I, I, I will confirm that, that Gene Sperling uh, will be remaining 
uh, in his position through at least January uh, into early February to uh, participate as he has so effectively over uh, these many years in the process uh, uh, around the State of the Union address that the President will deliver at the end of January uh, and to uh, continue work on some of the issues that he's been focused on. So uh, he'll also obviously assist in the transition to Jeff Zients, who will take over that position, and we expect in early February. And then that last question following up on Snowden. Um, he apparently has <coughs> sought asylum in Brazil. Um, is the United States in touch with Brazil about that request? Our view, as I said earlier, has not changed. Uh, we believe that uh, Mr. Snowden ought to be returned to, ought to return to the United States, uh, where he uh, faces charges for leaking classified information. Uh, and where he will receive full due process and uh, protections. Um, you know, the, the broader issues uh, uh, with regards to Brazil and uh, other nations uh, and the disclosures are ones that we discuss directly uh, with uh, those nations through diplomatic channels and uh, with our Brazilian counterparts, and that will continue. But when it comes to Mr. Snowden, our views certainly haven't changed. Bill. Jay, uh, with respect to the NSA re review panel's report, when did you say that would be released to the public? I said publicly. I don't have a, a date for you. I, I, as, I, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, we expect that it will be released. Did you say January? Just to clarify, you said the review would be completed in January. Yeah, I, I, what I know is that our internal review, that the, the, the word is uh, being applied to several different things, but the overall review that's happening uh, here will be completed in January. The report, the review group's report, which has been completed and submitted to the President, uh, will be released publicly. I just don't have a, a date for when that will happen. I certainly expect it will be no later than January. It could be sooner or through it, Jay. Well, again, I, no later than January certainly suggests it could be sooner. I just don't have a date, Bill. Sorry. Bill. Well, yeah. Well, what is the reasoning for not releasing it now? If you're going to release the full report, I think it's, it's rather extraordinary that, I mean, you know, that part of the commitment to transparency here is, is, is that this will be released. I just don't have a date for you. I, I, Would transparency argue for releasing it now so we know well, what the report I think, the panel again, recommended? I don't have a date for you, uh, Bill. And when it's uh, released, uh, which I expect will be between now and the conclusion of the review here at the White House, uh, you'll be able to examine its contents and make assessments accordingly. Uh, but it is my understanding that it will be released publicly. Uh, Ed Henry. How are you, sir? Good. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about, about polls. I know that uh, we often talk about them and you say, look, we're not going to govern based on that. But you said yesterday the President's hopeful of still getting immigration reform done. Mm -hmm. I assume he has a lot uh, <laughs> on his agenda for 2014. When you look at the Washington Post ABC News poll today and they say that he ends his fifth year in office with uh, one of the worst approval ratings, I think only Nixon had been worse at the end of his fifth year in office. Uh, George W. Bush was higher, Bill Clinton was higher, both parties. <clears throat> How can he reasonably expect to get any of these big issues, like immigration reform, done next year? Because of the right thing to do. Because of the kinds of issues that have traditionally enjoyed bipartisan support. Uh, because they go directly to his uh, promise to f have as his top priority uh, economic growth and job creation and uh, creating a more secure and expanding middle class. Uh, because it's in the interest of Democrats and Republicans to pass comprehensive immigration reform. That's what law enforcement groups say. That's what big business says. That's what small business says. That's what uh, faith leaders say. That's what uh, Democrats and Republicans in the Senate say. It's what Republican uh, political leaders outside of Congress say. Uh, so uh, we think that that kind of consensus demonstrates why it's so important that we get this done for our economy, uh, for uh, the effect that it would have, the positive effect it would have on increasing border security, for the uh, effect it would have on creating fairness in the way that our uh, laws are applied and, and fairness when it comes to employers and making sure that they all play uh, by the same set of rules. Uh, so that, that's why. I also think, you know, there's, you know, there's no question that uh, the, uh, the American people are frustrated with Washington and with the uh, seeming uh, 
if not inability, then uh, minimal ability to get the kinds of things done that will uh, address their lives and help them economically, especially the middle class. I think we have seen uh, in recent days, including today, uh, some glimmers of hope that there might be a willingness to cooperate in a bipartisan way that we haven't seen recently in the past, especially out of the House of Representatives. So uh, for that reason, I think, as we talked about yesterday, there's uh, at least the possibility of greater cooperation and progress on a range of issues, including immigration reform. When you've been on both sides of this podium and you understand that a president also needs to be able to move the public mm -hmm. and then that can move the Congress. You've made those arguments on immigration reform, et cetera, before. Does he really still have the clout to move the public, to move the Congress on these big issues when his approval ratings continue to sink? Well, uh, Ed, again, I, I, you won't uh, hear an argument from me that uh, everyone in Washington has taken a hit because of Washington's uh, performance of late. Now, in recent days and weeks, there has been, uh, I think, some demonstrated improvement in Washington's performance when it comes to the uh, budget agreement, and also when it comes to the uh, fact that we're, we're seeing government, you know, Washington do some of the things that it's supposed to do, Congress do some of the things that it is supposed to do, like confirm qualified nominees for executive branch positions and for the bench. Uh, so this is progress, and all we can do here in Washington, everyone in, in uh, Congress and the administration, is uh, get to work on the issues that the American people care about and uh, you know, hopefully when the American people see that Washington is uh, doing just that, uh, then uh, they will see the uh, resulting improvements in the economy and in their own personal lives that these, these uh, initiatives are meant to address. So, uh, you know, that's all we can focus on. Um, I would also, you know, simply say that, uh, you know, this president has been focused on these issues since the day he took office amidst the worst economic collapse of our lifetimes, and he will be focused on them every day until he leaves office. A couple quick ones on health care. You mentioned the Microsoft executive, Mr. Delban, coming in. You said he had vast experience running a complex operation. There are statements out from Bill Gates and all these other <coughs> tech luminaries saying this person is terrific, is going to do a great job. Why in the world didn't the White House come up and hire someone like this in the summer, in the spring, a year ago to roll out healthcare.gov? I, I think your question goes to the uh, absolute acknowledgement that we've made that healthcare.gov uh, had a terrible start. Right, but and why, there's no question. But why, why didn't you go to the tech community and say, give us somebody who knows how to run a complex operation? I, well, I think it's fair to say that uh, given the experience we've had and given the uh, improvements that have been overseen by Jeff Zients and the continued improvements we expect to uh, see under Mr. Del Bene, that uh, you know, we think that was the right decision to make, and obviously we would have much preferred a more successful launch. And you know, if if that it can be, if that could have been affected by having somebody in this position in the past, then absolutely we should have had somebody in that position in the past. What I think you have seen me do, and the president do, and, and everyone involved in this effort do, is acknowledge at the outset, uh, in response to questions uh, of this nature, that yes. Healthcare.gov got off to a terrible start, and that is our responsibility. That is on us, and that's why we were so committed to making the improvements we've made, uh, and why every time I get asked on the positive side, you know, aren't, aren't, aren't you pleased by the, you know, dramatic increases in enrollments or by the, uh, the, error, uh, rate the down, error rate coming right. down, the increased ability? The answer is yes, but we have work to do. Yes, but we still have to deliver uh, on the promise of the Affordable Care Act, which isn't, which wasn't a promise to have a great website. It was a promise to make available to millions of Americans quality affordable health insurance. But so no one's going to be held accountable for not hiring somebody who knows this you stuff. You know, Ed, we've addressed the, that question and, and you, know, you know, we're about the business right now of making the Im improvements necessary uh, so that this uh, benefit that so many Americans clearly want is available to them. And the fact that we, in the first month plus of this exercise, threw up so many obstacles uh, in the way of Americans who wanted this benefit is our responsibility. And we uh, have uh, 
acknowledged that and addressed it, and we continue to do so, and we still have a lot of work to do. Yes, ma'am, we Thank talked yesterday. I said I'd call on you, and I'm calling on you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, two questions on North Korea. How does the uh, Obama administration's uh, evaluation for two years on the North Korean Kim Jong-il leadership in, or his regime? I have a Kim second. Jong-un or? Kim Jong-un. Yes. And the second question, does the United States, States have any contingency plan for a sudden collapse on, of North Korea? I think the only way to address this is, is to point to uh, what we've said in the past about North Korean behavior and uh, their failure to live up to uh, their international obligations, their failure to take steps that would uh, allow them to rejoin the community of nations and to end the intense isolation uh, that they are experiencing in the world, an isolation that has uh, combined with the regime's uh, decision to spend its, the, the, the resources it does have on military uh, procurement rather than feeding its own people has resulted in the impoverishment of the North Korean people. So uh, that's how we would evaluate circumstances in North Korea today. And then when it comes to contingency plans, uh, you know, I don't have anything to report on that, but obviously we always, uh, as any administration <coughs> does, would look at uh, a variety of contingencies. Yeah. Yesterday, uh, when the White House, when you all announced the meeting with the tech CEOs, you said in there that they were going to discuss, obviously, national security related to the revelations and then the economic effects or impact of these revelations. I what think this just you? addresses some of the concerns that uh, uh, some of the uh, tech companies have raised uh, in the wake of the disclosures. Uh, so that was, I think that was the reference. So not, not economic impact to the you know, U.S. economy overall, to their individual companies, if that makes sense? I, again, we'll have a fuller readout, but my understanding is that was uh, meant to respond to uh, or to acknowledge that we'd be discussing some of the issues that, that tech companies and their CEOs have raised. And is there any reason I should have asked earlier, but why no one from AOL is in the meeting, and they were the only signatory to that letter that doesn't have a representative in there? I'll have to take the question in terms of the, the makeup of the meeting. Uh, as you, I think, saw, it's a, a pretty impressive uh, uh, a group of individuals. Yeah, John and then Brianna. Uh, do you have any update on all, at all for uh, how successful uh, the effort to sign people, get people to enroll uh, healthcare at Gov's been in getting young people? What's the status on that? I don't have any data uh, specifically uh, broken down by age. Yeah, I would refer you to CMS. I'm not sure what they have. Uh, there's no question that overall between now and March 31st, uh, there needs to be a, a good mix of individuals uh, in, uh, who enroll in the marketplaces. As I think we've talked about in general, it is uh, common as we've seen from past experience, for enrollment uh, of any kind in these kind of programs, including the private health insurance that most of you enroll in and have open enrollment periods for, uh, to happen uh, disproportionately towards the end, and that young people are even more inclined uh, to wait until the last minute uh, uh, to get their paperwork done or their online uh, applications done. Uh, so uh, having stated those facts, I don't have any uh, specific information with regards to the age breakdown so far. Because CMS won't give that information out either. I mean, do, do you not have it? You must have I would it, right? I, just, I don't have it, so I would refer you to CMS. I, I don't have that data. And, and what efforts is the administration making to get young people to sign up? Well, I think you've seen uh, a broad-based effort to uh, focus on uh, the opportunities and uh, options available to millions of Americans across the country, including young people. I think that uh, if you uh, saw in the Wall Street Journal yesterday there was an article. I mean, we've often gotten questions about uh, or uh, statements from uh, uh, commentators about the fact that uh, it would be proof that enrollment is working and the website is functioning uh, for the vast majority of users when uh, you saw uh, outside groups, third party groups, including insurance companies, invest in uh, advertising to reach potential consumers. And I think there was a, uh, an important article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday about a number of insurance companies that are uh, investing substantial sums to do just that. And uh, I think that would uh, indicate 
uh, that they believe the opportunity to reach those potential consumers exists and uh, that uh, those consumers will be able to enroll in their plans if they so choose. So I, it's going to be, it's a broad-based effort and it continues uh, not just now but through March. What do you make of some of these efforts by Obamacare supporters to reach out? I mean, some of them, you know, the upside down mm -hmm. stance and whatnot. And I mean, is anybody going to buy health care because Barack Obreezy tells them to buy it because it's hot? Uh, I think that uh, not a, not a, having not designed uh, advertising campaigns myself, uh, I'm not an expert, but I think that, you know, people, des you know, there, there are efforts underway to reach potential consumers. Uh, you know where they live, if you will, and to and to get them to be aware of the options available to them and the wisdom of getting covered, of having health insurance, uh, and I think that's what all these uh, efforts are about. Uh, and we certainly uh, believe that there has been. I mean, one one fact is, in spite of you know when we were, it was being noted that. The effort, the advertising efforts, and the like, uh, had been pushed back because of the problems with healthcare.gov. I mean, one of the facts that I think often went unnoticed is that even despite that, we still have extraordinary levels of uh, interest demonstrated by the number of visits to the website itself, and that continues. We continue to see, uh, I think, something like half a million over the weekend uh, of visitors to healthcare.gov, so that the demand is there. And it's our responsibility to make sure that the system works so the demand can be met. Uh, Brianna. Yes, I said Brianna. Thanks, uh, Jay. We're nearing the end of the year here, uh, looking to the next year. Can you just talk a little bit about um, what are the President's biggest priorities? What is he hoping to achieve in 2014? Sure, I will uh, leave it to the President to be more specific. Uh, uh, but. And, and he will be uh, certainly at the State of the Union address. But his priority, which he made clear at a speech he recently gave here in Washington, is uh, the economic health uh, of the middle class uh, and uh, the prospects for future stronger economic growth for the country and job creation for the country. And that has been his priority since he came to office and will continue to be his priority going forward. And within that, context, uh, he is uh, concerned, as so many people are, uh, by the growing inequality that we've seen uh, and the effect that has on mobility, upward mobility for Americans across the country. This country is obviously n known for the remarkable mobility that it has afforded generations uh, in the past. And I think it's a sobering fact to learn that uh, countries in Europe uh, often, or in, in some cases, have uh, more upward mobility for their citizens now. That, that I think that illustrates why this is a problem that needs to be addressed. And you heard the President give a, a substantive, lengthy speech about that just uh, the other week. And he will certainly continue to address those issues. Comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, because it's so important for a variety of reasons, including, first and foremost, it's important for our economy, important for the middle class. And, uh, you know, the, his climate action plan, again, because uh, it addresses our long-term long energy needs and energy security needs, as well as uh, the need to address climate change. These are priorities that the President has put forward and will continue to push into 2014 and beyond. And if I can ask you a question, <clears throat> pardon me about the ACA. Mm -hmm. um, CMS last said that 10 percent of the 834s that were transmitted to insurance companies had errors in them. They're now saying that number is inaccurate, but they aren't providing an accurate percentage. So I guess really the question is, is the White House confident that what it, one, does the White House know what the percentage is? Does the White House have confidence that Whatever that number is, whatever that percentage is, coupled with the ability to identify these errors and the outreach that's going along with it, that that's going to mean the number of people who are aiming to be signed up for health insurance by January 1st, that that's going to be what we would see as minimal come January? I, I, I think I, I'm tracking. I, 
uh, as I said yesterday and previous days, there's no higher priority that CMS has and the administration has right now on ACA than uh, making sure that those individuals who uh, enrolled or believe they enrolled uh, are uh, taking the steps necessary and have the data to the insurer necessary that will allow them, if they sought insurance coverage on January 1st, to get it. Uh, and there are a variety of means by which uh, that communication is happening. Uh, when it comes to the back end issues, I can tell you that since the beginning of December, enrollments that did not generate the necessary transaction form, the 834 form, that goes to the insurance company has been close to zero. Now, what that means is that. No, I'm not no. I understand that, but that's not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be where we ask a question about. We know that 834s are being transmitted. I'm talking about the ones that are being transmitted and have errors in them. Right, and I'm saying that, uh, I mean, here, here's, because this is important, uh, as an anecdotal example, we are confident that we have made major improvements to healthcare.gov, including on the back end issues, that have reduced that transmission problem uh, to zero or near zero, and that have uh, addressed the problems with errors. I think an example of that is that insurers like Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas are saying uh, that they no longer need to follow up individually with enrollees to verify their information because the 834s are coming through cleaner. They're coming through accurately. Now what I've said is that what CMS is doing is uh, it reaching out to uh, individuals who enrolled, especially in the earlier period where there was a much uh, higher percentage of problems with uh, the back end issues in the 834 ish, uh, forms to make sure that uh, accurate information is being delivered to their insurers, to make sure that there is communication between the issuer and the enrollee so that the enrollee knows what he or she has to do in order to uh, have coverage uh, when they choose to have coverage, if it's January 1st or later. Uh, so, so the point is that, and I, we've been talking about this, the work that's being done on the uh, issue of 834 forms and, and ones that had errors in them or transmission problems uh, are, have to do with those closer to the launch date of October 1st. And as improvements were made, we saw fewer of those problems. Uh, and now we are at a situation where um, there are very few indeed. And the White House then has a firm grasp on what, if any, I mean, you assume there are going to be some. Are there going to be a small amount, a, a large amount? You're confident the White House has a grasp on the size of the problems that will confront people who are trying to sign up for insurance by January 1st. And by that, we mean people who obviously think mm -hmm. they are insured or have gone through the process and then come January find out maybe in a rather rude awakening. Well, I, I think that, that the aren't. administration, CMS, and, and that includes the White House, is, has made this a priority in our, our dealing with. But you feel and like you have a sense of the, the size of whatever problem may come I, up I, in January? I believe the answer to that is yes. I would point you to CMS because they're, they're doing the, the groundwork, the field work, if you will, but uh, as well as, the, you know, those teams that are meeting daily with issuers to address the concerns that they've had with 834s and, and I think a sign of progress uh, is the citation I made of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas. I think another sign of uh, progress is what I mentioned to John earlier, that is WellPoint Inc., which has held off for weeks on a planned campaign as problems with the website made it impossible for many consumers to sign up, said that it expects to spend up to $100 million by the end of the year on TV, social media, and print ads targeting, I forgot about this, John, targeting mostly young and healthy people. $100 million. Uh, that's pretty significant investment by a single company. And I think they, would not be, they wouldn't be making that investment if they didn't believe that uh, they would get some return on that investment, that they would uh, be able to, that they would attract consumers to their product and that those consumers would be able to purchase that product through the marketplace. Can you feel that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas is representative of other insurance companies' experiences? Well, I, I think that you obviously, I don't want to say that every insurance company uh, can be included in that, but it demonstrates what we are seeing, which is that in in real time, and we're seeing obviously a significant increase in the number of, in the amount of traffic and the number of enrollees of enrollees. There there are significantly fewer uh, problems with the back end and and the 834 forms, and that and and down 
or close to zero when it comes to the transmission of those forms. Yes, Peter and then Bill. Jay and Secretary Sebelius's blog announcement that Kurt Delbeni would be coming on beginning tomorrow. Mm -hmm. She says that he's agreed, uh, or the agreement is that he will stay through the middle or the first part of next year. I just wanted to get a sense of how long the White House believes they will have someone in this role before it's satisfied all the needs. Is he the last guy to do this, or will this exist in perpetuity as I, long I as wouldn't, Obama? I wouldn't. I would. I, I wouldn't presume to know, uh, Peter. Obviously. This position was created uh, not that many weeks ago when uh, Jeff Zients uh, filled it uh, and filled it uh, working seven days a week and uh, making significant progress in the effort to bring healthcare.gov up to the performance standards that the American people deserve. And uh, it is because of the Secretary's view and the President's view that that role should be filled by someone of the kind of experience that Mr. Delbeni brings to the uh, effort, that uh, it will be filled uh, at least for as long as uh, Kurt has agreed to, to serve in that role. I guess the question is, is there a standard point at which you'll be satisfied that you've accomplished everything you need, that that role is no longer needed? Well, what I, does just, that I look can't. Like? I, in terms of that role, obviously, enrollments in healthcare.gov or through healthcare.gov and it will continue. Uh, uh, beyond March 31st and, and, and year after year after year. What I can't tell you now is whether uh, we might make a judgment or the sec Secretary might make a judgment next spring, for example, or early summer that uh, that position should be filled again. As regard, uh, in regards to the tech meeting that took place or is still taking place, as it sounds like, uh, right now with the President, couldn't the problem in many ways be solved by having the phone companies keep track of this data as the review board is apparently recommending? Well, I can't speak to uh, recommendations by the review board. As I said, I think uh, the board will uh, make available their report and their recommendations. So I, and I also don't, I, I think that that is an issue that has been uh, put forward in, in, in public uh, discussion. So I, I'm aware of that as a, as a proposition, but I don't have any comment on that as a recommendation at this time because the President's review is ongoing. And then if you can give us a sense of some of the tech companies um, have, have been very delicate in the language they've used about exactly what rules are governing, what they can and cannot communicate. So I guess I would pose simply, why shouldn't the tech companies be allowed to tell the public more about what they're being told to provide? Uh, again, I'm not, that, I mean, in terms of what they, what they can, I mean, whatever, you know, What's the risk of them being more transparent about what they're being required to provide? I'm not sure of what their obligations are in terms of legal obligations, and I'd refer you to the Department of Justice for those issues, if that's what you're asking me. I guess what's at stake? If they were, if they were to say more, not the, spe not the specifics yeah, I, of that. I think that's the kind of question that I would have to uh, point you to the Department of Justice or elsewhere to answer perhaps the NSA in terms of if it has to do with intelligence gathering activities. and. Uh, and potentially classified programs. And finally, if I can, earlier today we learned that six more Americans died in Afghanistan uh, during a Black Hawk, I believe it was, that crashed. If the President's been notified and if he has any comments specific to this most recent. Uh, uh, I'll have to get information on uh, by whom and when the President uh, was notified. This is obviously, uh, as is the case any time, uh, we lose uh, men and women in uniform. Uh, a, a tragedy and, and uh, something that we mourn greatly and, and it it's, a, it's a reminder of uh, even as we go about our lives here stateside that we have so many of our fellow Americans serving in harm's way uh, still in Afghanistan. Do you know more question about the tech meeting? I'll have to, I don't know yet. Caused by enemy action? I, I, I would refer you to the Defense Department, I don't know. Just one more question about the tech meeting. Did, did the letter that they penned last week prompt this meeting? Uh, I don't have the answer to that. I'll have to take the question. I think that it has been, uh, you know, we have had in this administration in particular ongoing interactions with uh, major tech companies and major tech CEOs uh, for the entirety of the administration. So uh, whether this specific meeting was in response to that letter, I can't say, but this is not the first time the president has sat down with tech CEOs. Uh, sure, and it, 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 it may just be that the meeting uh, because it, the meeting has as it, on its agenda other issues besides this, 
uh, you know, may have been something that was going to be scheduled anyway. Was it still going on? You came out. Yes. Um, John. Uh, <clears throat> with regard to immigration, if the president is in the desired position of implementing an immigration law, what would the White House take as a learning experience from uh, the healthcare.gov mm -hmm. and the rollout of health care? You've got nine million is the estimate of people who would be uh, applying for legalization through various means, mm -hmm. uh, different pathways. You've got an e-verify system that requires businesses to interact with the administration. What have you learned from that uh, that would help you implement immigration, and what assurances can you give the public that that would roll out better than mm -hmm. I got healthcare? pretty much the same question yesterday, uh, and you know I would say that these are two different kinds of uh, things, very significantly different. The, f the, the fundamental problems with uh, the rollout of the marketplaces had to do with the technology associated with healthcare.gov with a website that was uh, uh, trying to do something rather significant and unprecedented and is doing it now much more effectively. Uh, so I think I, I would note before uh, the analogies are made that there are significant differences in implementations of uh, these two pieces of legislation. Uh, I certainly hope that uh, for the sake of the country and the economy and border security and innovation that we have the opportunity to implement comprehensive immigration reform uh, because uh, the economy needs it and uh, our security needs it. So you're, I understand that you're saying that they're not perfectly analogous and certainly there are a lot of differences between the two, but are there lessons to be learned from the implementation of a major, uh, a major program that requires a lot of technology for the next one that has well, a I, lot of technology. I haven't looked at the I haven't looked at the technological aspects of implementing comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, a big piece of it is border security, and I think that this administration has demonstrated uh, its commitment to and success in improving our border security. Uh, and uh, a piece of it has to do with uh, improving our legal immigration process, so that uh, those who come and study in our universities can and want to start businesses here can stay here and start businesses in the United States and hire American workers to do that uh, when they do that. Uh, so these are things that uh, build on uh, what we've already demonstrated a capacity to uh, do. So I, I'm, I, I guess I, I, I'm not suggesting there wouldn't be lessons learned. I'm saying that because I haven't looked at the specific requirements of implementing immigration reform, I, I wouldn't uh, be the person uh, best able to tell you what specific lessons might be learned from the problems at healthcare.gov versus the problems associated with, uh, you know, bringing 11 million undocumented people uh, out of the shadows and into a system where they get to the back of the line and, uh, and move through a process uh, like the one envisioned through comprehensive immigration reform. Yes? Uh, a couple questions on the CEO meeting. It appears it was going on at least twice as long as it was <coughs> scheduled for. Even when you came out, did you have any indication on what direction that meeting was going? Uh, I, d I did, and I, and I, uh, that's what I provided to you. That I know that they sp spoke about. Uh, I know, not not just anticipated, but know that they had already discussed uh, healthcare.gov issues. They spoke about uh, procurement uh, issues related to federal IT, and they spoke about uh, issues related to disclosures, uh, as I noted in uh, my brief uh, readout of a meeting that was still going on. Meeting with the CEOs on the NSA. They also, and then of course, the president announced, and he's in the room, the appointment of Kurt Del Bene uh, to succeed Jeff Zients. My meeting with the CEOs on the NSA today, what's, what message is he trying to send to businesses and, and the American people? Uh, as I think we've said in the past, uh, in addressing national security and economic impacts related to unauthorized intelligence disclosure, the president. Uh, was hoping to hear from, directly from the CEOs of uh, these companies about these issues and their concerns, and also obviously looking for the opportunity to explain both uh, how these programs are viewed by him and uh, the fact that he is engaging in the kind of uh, comprehensive review of our signal intelligence gathering uh, that has been undertaken now for the past several weeks and months and which will conclude in January looking at, as I've said in the past, uh, what we do through essentially two prisms. One, the absolute value that uh, the NSA and other 
agencies in our intelligence community provide in keeping the American people, the United States, and our allies safe, uh, and doing so in a way that uh, is legal and constitutional. He also has made clear that uh, because of the uh, remarkable advancements in technology that uh, the United States uh, has both led the way in and been able to take advantage of, but as have other countries, we uh, need to look at our activities uh, through the lens of making sure that we're doing what we can and should, uh, but not just, or, or what we should to keep ourselves uh, safe, but not just what we can because we have the technological capacity to do it. And I think that is the sort of lay uh, framework around which the President has been approaching this review. Is he concerned that the Snowden re revelations have hurt his reputation for trustworthiness and transparency? <coughs> Look, I think that the, you know, the, the, the disclosures have been problematic in far more significant ways uh, than how they affect uh, people's view of him, or uh, they've been problematic because they are leaks of classified information. And uh, that is why uh, Mr. Snowden has been, uh, has had charges brought against him, and, uh, you know, uh, others can address the impacts of those kinds of disclosures on our activities and uh, our safety and security. I think those are the issues that concern the President. There are indications that he does have some problems with, with, with that aspect of his reputation. What, what's the President doing to rebuild that, uh, that trust? The President is focused every day on uh, what he has committed himself to do, which is to work on behalf of the American people uh, to uh, create an economy or help help foster an economy that is growing from the middle out instead of the top down, uh, that is uh, making more secure and expanding the middle class, that's creating ladders of opportunity for those who aspire to membership in the middle class, uh, that is bringing jobs back home to the United States uh, so that we can uh, have the kind of uh, industries and businesses that create good jobs that sustain uh, secure middle class lives. And that's his focus. Also is, his focus is the safety and security of the American people, and he is uh, fiercely committed to that. But as you've heard him say in regards to the issues around these disclosures, he, you know, he has been very candid and frank about uh, the need to review our activities uh, in the way that I described, and, and he has undertaken this in a very deliberate way. Uh, that review the overall review, there's a lot of different reviews within the review, but the overall review will be completed in January. What about, how about with foreign leaders? How, what's he doing to repair his, that relationship, rebuild that sure, relationship? I, I've gotten this question a, a lot with regard to countries uh, who, that have expressed concerns about uh, the disclosures, and we, we deal directly, counterpart to counterpart, leader to leader, as well as minister to minister uh, on these issues and through the normal diplomatic channels, uh, and we are doing that with uh, leaders in countries that have uh, been a part of the disclosures uh, uh, as a matter of uh, regular order. Voice of America. Thank you. Um, Jay, on South Sudan, how has the President been keeping apprised of events there? We had a curfew in effect. There were fresh reports of uh, new battles um, uh, there in South Sudan. And uh, this was an issue that he's mentioned several times, mm -hmm. including at the United Nations. Does he have uh, well, he gets briefed on it, uh, on, on developments there, and as you, uh, I think, are noting in your question, the circumstances there have uh, gotten worse, and we remain deeply concerned about developments in South Sudan. We are monitoring the situation closely and continue to call on all parties to resolve their differences peacefully and democratically. We want to see an end to the violence and for South Sudan to get back to working toward realizing the vision it articulated at its independence of forging an inclusive, democratic state at peace internally and with its neighbors. Recent violence moves South Sudan further from, not closer to, that goal. But if South Sudan chooses peace and democracy, we are confident that it can get back on uh, track. So the President gets briefed on it. We're very concerned about the developments we've seen. Um, our embassy, I think, is, has been reported elsewhere, is uh, currently closed, and we are moving to an order of departure because of the uptick in violence. Um, and we call on the government to open critical points of entry and egress, uh, including at the airport. Any calls to I don't have any uh, 
presidential calls to read out. I'm sure if you speak with state, there are communications government to government. Anne. Thank you very much. Did the President ask Secretary Sebelius to initiate the Inspector General's uh, review inside the Department of HHS? And because it's an in-house uh, review, uh, is that good enough? And does it indicate Secretary Sebelius's job is uh, secure? Uh, I would, I think Secretary Sebelius or the Department has put out in information about that review that I, I believe she initiated. Uh, and I, you know, I've answered questions about this in the past. The President has confidence in Secretary Sebelius. Uh, and uh, he uh, knows that she, like everyone on her team, is focused on uh, implementing the Affordable Care Act, in making improvements to healthcare.gov, uh, and ensuring that we deliver on the promise to the American people uh, that they would have access to quality, affordable health insurance That's through the marketplaces. That, that his first priority is to get the website up and working and people enrolled, but then it would be time to find out what mm -hmm. happened. Does the President think it's uh, the right path to investigate that within the Department by the Inspector General as opposed to some other kind of investigation? I mean, I think, I think uh, there's plenty of oversight happening uh, uh, on Capitol Hill, and we uh, agree with, or rather, uh, cooperate with all legitimate oversight into this matter and others, and we're doing that now. Uh, I certainly uh, don't think there's any disagreement with the actions that Secretary Sebelius has taken. Uh, they, they are entirely appropriate. Uh, are they however, we're, f we're focused on implementing the Affordable Care Act, making sure that uh, the, those millions of Americans who have demonstrated, despite the obstacles that have been put in front of them, their intense interest in enrolling in the marketplaces and purchasing health insurance through the marketplaces are able to do so uh, in a timely fashion. That's been our focus, and that's what people have been working on 24 to 7. And the President said he's, he w wants to know what, what went wrong. Yeah, I don't have any update, Ann, on, on what he said uh, about he that or what what she's doing now. Uh, he has confidence in Secretary Sebelius, believes that what she's doing is appropriate, and again, he wants his team principally focused on delivering on the promise of the Affordable Care Act because so many millions of Americans continue to demonstrate their interest in this, their desire for it, uh, as measured by the uh, substantial traffic at healthcare.gov and as measured elsewhere. And as, you know, and as we've seen, as I cited earlier, uh, the uh, efforts that are beginning to uh, take place uh, from outside groups, from insurance companies and others, uh, in this effort to make sure that those Americans who uh, have these options available to them are aware of those options and take advantage of them if they so desire. April. Jane, the White House or HHS offering any kind of help to states that are having problems with their websites, their health care websites? <laughs> I'm not specifically aware of what that communication is. I, I'm sure there is some, but I think HHS or CMS could could uh, give a more detailed answer. It depends, I mean, I think you would have to ask them. I think the answer is probably yes, but you would have to ask them specifically which state and which issue. So are we in a window now that mm -hmm. there's no um, expectation that anything could be delayed, any kind of timelines will be extended or delayed because things are now fixed or, or in the process of No, I think that what we've said is that we are working to uh, do everything we can to make, as I was just saying, uh, this, uh, these options available to Americans who want them. And uh, we have taken a number of steps to make this process easier uh, for uh, those Americans who have either had trouble because of the healthcare.gov website or because of the cancellations uh, of existing policies. You know, we're, and so we're, we're continuing to address and, and, and make the adjustments necessary to make this transition as smooth as possible, again, with the goal being uh, providing access to the quality, affordable health insurance that so many millions of Americans uh, so clearly desire. Thanks, Jackson. All right, Alexis, last one. Jay, a couple um, quick follow-ups. Um, on the single surveillance review, um, some months back you made clear that the administration, President Obama, had already made some modifications, interim modifications, mm -hmm. and you might remember what those were related to, but to what extent will the President be specific with the international audience and the American people when he does finish the review and get to talk about all of the changes put together that he's accepted. I, I think you can expect the President will speak to this issue, will uh, make remarks about it, outlining what uh, the outcomes of 
the review that, that has been conducted, and that will take place in January, I expect. Uh, but I think he does desire to be uh, as specific and detailed as he can be, given the, the issues here. I think that's reflected in the fact that the, uh, the review group on intelligence and communications technologies will be releasing its report uh, publicly. So uh, I, I, the President's comments and remarks about uh, the steps that he'll be taking or has taken, uh, I think, will reflect uh, that same uh, desire for it, providing as much in information about it as possible. Two other questions. Um, both on Friday <coughs> and today, uh, you have described the President's legislative agenda as including his climate action plan. And there are people in Washington who think that a midterm year in divided government is a challenging year to try to press for climate change legislation. Can you expand on what the President hopes to um, urge Congress to adopt? In 2014 on climate change? Well, I think the if you look at the Climate Action Plan, uh, when I talk about that as part of the President's agenda, I talk about that as part of the President's agenda, not just his legislative agenda. And I've mentioned this with regards to economic measures and other measures, including uh, measures to reduce gun violence, that uh, we absolutely want to work with Congress and get bipartisan legislation passed where we can and where Congress uh, chooses to be, especially House Republicans cooperative. Uh, and. Uh, to work in a spirit of compromise to get things done that the American people want done. But where uh, Congress uh, refuses to act, uh, the President will uh, avail himself of uh, whatever means he can to act administratively to uh, advance an agenda that he believes uh, is vital to our economic growth and to the middle class. So uh, I don't have sp specifics. I'll leave that to the President in terms of what actions he'll be taking, what legislation he'll be proposing, how he envisions working with Congress, and how he envisions uh, making progress uh, elsewhere. Uh, on these issues that are so clearly vital to our economic growth, vital to jobs, and, and vital to our national security. One other thing to follow up. There's been some reporting on the President's interest in planning for his presidential <coughs> library, the early stages of putting together a team. Uh, do you know if the President has made a decision to be transparent about the donors who uh, contribute to the construction and development of the <coughs> library and center? I think my reading of that story is what my understanding is. There isn't even an effort that exists yet. Uh, there isn't a, 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 you know, even an outside organization that exists yet. I know that he and everyone here is focused on advancing the President's agenda for his second term that we just talked about. So I, uh, I think uh, we're ahead of ourselves, as I, that, that article reflected. Thanks very much.